My regular co-host, Laura. Right. I got Patty Cohen coming She's in. She's like a nice guy. He's a very nice guy. And then uh, I got someone on the phone. You know, uh, Airfare Watchdog, you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I get the president coming on. Oh, that. interesting. Can you talk about, you know, all the little travel stuff? It's, well, it's, it's hard to keep track of all the new companies in the different fields. Exactly. Nowadays, it's just amazing. Yeah. American business is so uh, innovative. Yeah. Mm. So there's just great possibilities. I think we've always been a country that believes in anything is possible. That's yeah. what that's what makes us so unique. Also, you know, it's the it's the land of opportunity. Doesn't matter what mm -hmm. your background is. Anybody can make it if they want, if they try hard enough. Yeah, or you can just live a hedonistic life like I do. <laughs> <laughs> You're not so hedonistic. Oh, uh, I'm having a good time right now. Let me tell you. Oh yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. One time you get to spend two and a half hours on the water. Oh yeah. Yeah, I haven't been out to the beach in so long. Oh, you should go yes, right yeah. now. It's so nice. And Crockett's not that far. Mm -hmm. It's about a 25-minute drive from here. Yeah. Take my motorcycle. Yeah, you can take a motorcycle. And the nice thing is you can go over the the mountain, and when you do, you get that famous view of the city yeah. with the bridge. Yeah. Oh, God. Just today well, was a I, someone, I went up to Lighthouse for uh, Labor Day uh, just, just Friday, come back Saturday. And, and up in the friend, Delta? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a friend uh, come. He, he loaned his boat. And so we were just cruising around. And then he was telling me, and I'd never heard about this, but... There are these boats that have um, a certain kind of ballast that they do something with the, the wave in back of them so that people, what, what happens is you get up basically on like a little surfboard, mm -hmm. you start off holding on, and then you let go, and you're surfing behind the boat because yeah. the wave does that. Can I imagine? Yeah. I know, it's like fun. And it's a, you know, I mean, you're going. It's not rocket wave. science. You can yeah. do that. Yeah. yeah, you're only doing like 15 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. so it's, you know, That's great. You know, for, us, for us old parts, it's like something. <laughs> There were a lot of young kids out there. Today. Well, actually, it's not true. There were a lot of older guys. I ran into three guys I know who were all right about your age, early 50s. Yeah. And they're all, one guy's just a really hardcore surfer. I mean, he really, he's been doing it forever. He's got two 21 year old kids he got into it. Wow. And they're just really starting to cook. Uh, How about that guy who broke his neck? Mmm. Mm -hmm. I got thrown into a reef. Yeah. And then, that's, and a, that's why you have to be careful. Big, one thing in a big way, either. Mm -hmm. Well, but he's done this. It, it was breaking in shallow water. Yeah. And that's the trouble. I I hate surfing in shallow water. It's just not safe. Because that's the most dangerous thing. Yeah. Is to get thrown in I got thrown in a reef in Hawaii. Split my head open at a concussion. Wow. Yeah, it was nasty. And I was back out the next day. The doctor said, You shouldn't go out. And I said, I, you know, I'm over here to have fun. I'm not over here to sit yeah. around and you could easily drown or something like that, because you know, you could be swearing. It just shook me up pretty good. But that was okay. It was it was more of a, a nuisance than anything else. Yeah. I was too stunned to really be upset about it. <laughs> kind of like getting tackled in the open field. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. There we go. All right. I don't have to worry about any connection to a uh, phone today, do you? Yeah. No, At least yeah, not for the first show. Yeah. All righty. <clears throat> All right, let's get this uh, chicken in. Okay. Welcome. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. This is the show where we, sp we, where do we do? We discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co host, radio sports personality, Bruce McGowan. And today's show, now, we, today we don't have a guest. It's just you at Mono and Mono here. That's right. But we'll have some fun. We will. Uh, let's see. What are we going to do? At every commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question. We're going to be giving away a vacation to the first email with the correct answer. And the vacation is not sponsored by the radio station, but by a lighthouse resort and marina. And uh, get this. This trivia theme, this, remember how we kept doing miscellaneous? Uh -huh. This time it's 1980s baseball. Oh, I like that. I, I, co I covered 1980s baseball. Yeah, so you should get yeah. every one. I should. Players. If I don't, I'm, I'm not worth my weight in salt. That'd be worth a lot of money. I guess it would be. I mean, not that you're fat or anything, but you know, yeah. a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of a lot of salt weighs a lot of money. There you, there you go. Costs a lot. Okay. Costs a lot. There you go. Let's see. Uh, a couple of quick things. Uh, then you and I talked about this off air, uh, but I want to get into like sliding back to first base. Mm -hmm. You and I talked about that okay. one yeah, yeah. strategy there. 
uh, a little bit about uh, the new NBA playoff structure. Now, we were supposed to have Bob Myers, couldn't make it this week. We'll have him on again. And uh, also, I'm kind of, I want to ask him, and I'll ask you too, about uh, when you break up a team, a winning team, you know, how, how does that how do you do that? You know, how do you, you do that? Like, yeah, you almost want to, like, don't touch anything. It's you know, not broken. To me, that's like a, a businessman who owns a great, very successful business just deciding, ah, I don't want to have success anymore. I'm going to break it up. <laughs> it makes no sense. <laughs> Why do you do it? I mean, to save money? You're going to lose money. You know, to, to make money, as you know, Edward, you're a businessman. To make money, you got you to spend money. Many times that is yeah. correct. Yeah, most right. of the time it's correct in sports. Not always, but most of the time. Yeah, the Yankees used to, or they still do, they just try to buy them. Uh, and, they, and they do very well. A lot of teams don't do very well. Some teams just don't know how to do it. No, but they still, yeah, they still have a, a value, valuable franchise. They do indeed. All right, uh, this segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, providing mortgage investments that are currently yielding. In fact, they just came out with their re- latest report, 8.17% wow. compounded to 8.47%. Check them out. Doesn't get any more conservative than that at PacificPrivateMoney.com. Stay with us. Sports Econ 101. I'll be right back. Just realized it's funny. I, I, I uh, changed headsets here oh. just for the fun. And I don't like this one. So this one. Hey, who was the guy that the, the 49ers picked up a defensive lineman? <sighs> Shoot. From uh, Arizona. And he was, he was a former three-time All-Pro. And he got cut. After they picked him up as a free agent, I think it was Dockery or Dickery Doc. I can't Doc. Yeah. Don't remember his Doc. name. He was, a, he was a very good player in Arizona. And then uh, it's interesting. Arizona lost its top two defensive linemen um, to the Raiders and to the 49ers. And the guy that went to the Raiders is staying you know, with the Raiders. Okay. So, um, I can't remember his name either right now. I'm having a senior moment here. Definitely. <laughs> uh, we all, we're all guilty of that. Notes there? Yeah, I'm just writing some names down that I said I don't forget. <clears throat> Can't wait for the NFL season to start. Going to every game this year in the Bay Area. <laughs> every game. I haven't done that in a while. Not since the, probably since about 96. I mean, really? Are you going to go? Going to go to every, every home game. Yeah. For both teams. Both teams. Well, they don't, they don't, <laughs> there's one weekend where they play at the same time, where they, one plays in the afternoon, one plays at night. So I may have to miss one of those. Or you just. I could go to both, but I could just get to halftime for the second one. Yeah. I haven't been to a football game since Monday Night Football and the Hilton Raiders in the 1970s. Oh my God. You haven't been to an NFL game since you were just a kid, huh? No. Yeah. How come you never go? No, just, um. Just too much of a pain in the rear, right? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, when you watch on TV, you get a lot, yeah, a lot out of it. Of that's course, true. you know, an exciting game, like the Super Bowl, be different, but, um, wow. Well, I've been, I've been to about, together, yeah, I've been to about 520 <laughs> NFL games in my life. And about 200, probably three, close to 300 uh, college football games, plus 10 Super wow. Bowls. So, yeah, I've seen my share of football. <laughs> Seen my share. Baseball, 4,000 games. I thought it was 6,000. Well, 6,000 sporting events I've been to. Ah, okay. NFL, NBA, 1,200 games. College yeah. basketball, maybe another 600. NHL hockey, another 400. I mean, it's just ridiculous how much sports How many I've soccer seen. games? Probably, eh, probably close to a couple hundred. Really? Yeah, I covered the Seattle Sounders, the, the uh, okay. Portland Timbers, and also the uh, New York Generals. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, many, with uh, Pelé. How many uh, lacrosse? I haven't ever covered a single lacrosse game. We'll Tennis, I've covered probably about yeah, 30 or 40. Golf, maybe 30 or 40. Yeah, horse racing, maybe a couple dozen. Auto racing, maybe half a dozen. Yeah. Uh, track and field, one or two. That's pretty much it in track and field. Specialty. Yeah. Mm. That's fun. Maybe that's covered how many years? Uh, well, since 75. But then there were games I went to before that. But I probably went to maybe 200 games as a kid. 
kid. Well, that's a lot of games, though. Yeah. It's a kid. Let's see some fun stuff. Oh, yeah. No, I got to see some great, great athletes. What kind of fun things talk about when we come off that? Sure, sure, sure. I can tell you some interesting stories. Okay, there's the answer we want. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's just kind of go into a couple. Sure. Okay. Wait, wait. Well, welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Now, okay, you and I talked about this about a week ago or so. You know, you're watching TV. The guy on, there's a runner on first base. He's taking his lead. And it's a pickoff throw. Why on earth do these guys die bat with their right hand? That's the closest part to the first baseman when he's trying to tag you. I don't care if you're right-handed or left-handed. You should always go to the... Left side. To the huh? left side. I've never really thought about it, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those things, I can tell, it's one of those things that really bothers you, and it's yeah. interesting. That's the great thing about baseball to me, or, or, is baseball has all these little subtleties and these little idiosyncrasies. I'm not saying the other sports don't, but because the game, the pace of the game moves kind of languidly and slowly, we have a chance to really enjoy that. Yeah. Football, I don't think, unless you're a hardcore fan and watch film in slow motion, you really appreciate the way a linebacker, you know, bounces off of, of a block and makes a great tackle. But that's still a spectacular part of the game that sometimes, most of the times, we miss. Well, when you have 11 on 11, and yeah, there's so many things too many happening. Things happening at once. Yeah. You know, baseball is the, the ball, the bat, the guy throwing it, the guy catching it. it it's all very isolated, and yet at the same time, there's extremely uh, explosive moments in baseball that, to me, just make uh, the drama of going to a baseball game. A lot of people say, oh, it's boring, it's slow. To me, it's the best sport. It always has been. I, I, I've, I've always enjoyed it myself. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I wonder if managers or coaches even go over this. I'm sure they do. You know, it's interesting you bring that up. I, I've never heard actually anybody talk about this, but it does not surprise me that you're bringing it up because there are so many little things that drive fans crazy. And managers, too. They see something. Why are you doing that? Yeah. What? Yeah, what have professor. you been taught? You know, you're a professional. Yeah. What have you been taught? You know, I mean, one thing that you don't see in baseball anymore, which I think is a mistake, is you don't see players playing pepper anymore. Remember when we yeah, were kids? Yeah, sure. They'd stand, and, and for those that aren't old enough to remember this, what, they, what people would do is you get two players with bats and two with balls, and they'd just stand side by side of each other, and the guys with the balls would throw the guy to the bat, and the guy with the bat would just sort of half swing and half bunt, hit ground ball back to the guy, catch him on the bounce, yeah. keep throwing. And they don't do that anymore. Little things like that. I think those are things, hand-eye coordination, it's, that's a great exercise. I, mean, I still remember the signs that said, no pepper. Yeah, I never, I have not figured out, I've got to talk to somebody, why Why did you get rid of pepper? Pepper is a great game. It's a great way of improving your hand-eye coordination and your reflexes, and it's, you know, for baseball, it's perfect. And who was the one who uh, would not even use a glove because he wanted to have soft hands? I'm trying to remember who that Boy, was. I think he was a be shortstop. Before my time. Oh, you have to be a long time ago. You know, just think about going after a ground ball or a line drive with nothing but your bare hands. Well, you know, I don't, I don't mean that they would hit, like, you know, super hard to him. Right. But, but the whole idea was just to kind of have soft hands. Oh, he was playing pepper without Yeah. Them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> the, the, and the other thing, too, is like, okay, and I know it's kind of hard because based on how fast you are in your stride, but I always thought that when you're, you know, let's say you're trying to stretch something into a double or a triple, right, a hit. When you're coming to first base, I always thought it's best to hit the bag with your right foot and push off of it toward the next bag. And, and, and preferably on the inside, too, so you, you yeah, minimize exactly. the amount of space. If you watch the great runners, some of them aren't the fastest, but they're the smartest. They Remember, Davey Lopes used to be a great base runner. Now, yeah, he'd steal a fair number of bases, but he wasn't. He wasn't speedy. He, too speedy. Not too speedy, yeah. but he would, he would cut, do what they call cut the bag. He'd cut on the inside, and he said... Later, he told me, years later, when he was coaching, he said he probably took 15 feet off of his total run by cutting that bag. Because when you go on the outside, you take a longer looping stride, and your your stride is further, and you're wasting. Now, you're talking time. about as you're running the first. As you're running the you, first. You, you, go, you go to the outside. You go to the inside of the bag. You hit the inside. It just touches no, the No, but, but do, I guess what I'm getting at, do you run straight down? Well, it depends on if the if you've got a sure base hit or you've got a double. You don't need to, to go, like, straight down on the line as you do on a ground ball when you're trying to beat the throw. Because yeah, exactly. you, you, what you want to do is you want to accelerate coming out of that bag, and if you can get the inside of that bag, you'll save yourself two or three feet, two or three strides, yeah. which might get you... And, a, and would he hit it with his right foot? Yeah, yeah, you okay, would. Okay, because when I was uh, coaching softball, for some reason, the coach was saying, 
Nope, you want to hit with the left. I know, well, and yeah. I'm looking at that and I keep saying, it doesn't make sense to me. Because no, you, know, you got to push off of it. Maybe that coach is just trying to be like, you know, different. <laughs> yeah, anyway, Put his own maybe. stamp on things, you know? Yeah. Didn't, didn't exactly well, I was work. a woman. And actually, oh. she was a very good coach. But ex but that was the one thing I kind of looked at. I go, yeah. I don't see that. Don't, don't see that. Can't, that can't doesn't make sense. That. Yeah. And also, if you remember, like the uh, the Cardinals in the, in the 60s, 70s, and actually in the 90s, too, they small ball. Yeah. You know, a lot of bunting, a lot oh, of yeah. bases. And Dodgers stuff. used to be that way. Back in the 60s, Dodgers would manufacture yeah. one yeah. walk. Well, Murray Wells would steal Murray second, Wells. go to third on a pass ball, and score on a, on a ground ball up the middle. That okay. was a Dodgers okay. offense. Now, you've done this once before. <laughs> i got to ask you, since we're talking yeah. about this, you got to do your Ricky Henderson. Uh, Ricky Henderson, uh, you know, people ask me what a Ricky Rally is. Ricky Rally, <laughs> that's, uh, that's when I walk, I steal second, I go to third, I sacrifice fly, and I score a wild pitch. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have to laugh. That's, that's Ricky Rally. Ricky Rally. What else you want to know? But if you think about it, that one base hit, yeah. and, and you're scoring. You know what I loved about Ricky Henderson? Ricky Henderson went after the first, he was always a leadoff hitter. Went after the first pitch more than anybody I ever saw. Yeah. I love that. I Luke, Luke Rock was that way too. The game was just you were just settling down, and boom, he was swinging away, yeah. and there's action. We well, got to figure. Yeah. It, uh, see, I like that too because I'm thinking ordinarily the pitchers when they first come out, they're not trying to paint the corner. No, so they just well, they want the first pitch to be right, yeah. straight, and true. And if you're a hitter, that's one of the best pitches you're going to get. That's what that's, that's what I think too. That's you what should. I mean, about. not necessarily, but you should. That's what was driving me crazy about Brandon Belt for a long time. Um, Giants the uh -huh. last few years, he would always watch the first pitch. Yeah, some guys are that way. Just, it's, and then once you get that first strike, okay, now you only got two more shots. Yeah. Some yeah. people, well, you know, some people are, are more impetuous than others and less people, some people are more patient, you know, like, whatever works for you. But I think, I agree with you. I think if you get a good pitch to hit in your first pitch thrown to you, you should go for it because you may not get another good pitch. I mean, you know, once they set you up in an 0-1 count or 0-2 count, now they're going to fiddle with a, a breaking ball yeah. and some kind of slider away or jam you with a fastball. You're not going to get that good pitch. <laughs> okay, uh, what are your thoughts on swinging 3-0? You know, if a pitch is good, and it depends on the situation. I mean, it depends, like, you know, who's it on base, what the score is, who's at bat. But generally speaking, if, it's a, if you're a decent hitter and it's not a critical situation and the pitch is right back down the plate, why not? You've seen hitters yeah, do it. What a second and a half to decide. Yeah, but but if you, but if you have say bases loaded and it's a close game, you know, hey, I don't care unless you're Willie Mays, you're yeah. going to take that pitch. That's you know, come on. Unless you're with it. Unless you're Buster Posey, you know, you know, and somebody like that, you know, yeah, John Josh Donaldson. I don't know. Yeah, he's a, but Posey's having a little bit of a. Well, he's been you know Gi the Giants in general are worn down. They've had a lot of injuries. That's what's, I think if they had stayed healthy this year, they would definitely be in the race. They lost. They've lost so many one-run games. No Crawford. No Pence. No Pagan. No Joe Panic. I mean, those are key guys. So, but everybody's in the same boat. You know, Giants just happen to have more. Last year they didn't have any bad breaks. That's why they won it all. That, that's true. There were a lot of teams that had uh, yeah. a lot of injuries. You got it. Now you know that's true, Edward. I mean, it's the old saying: you got to stay healthy. You got to be good, and you got to be lucky. But you got to stay healthy to win the World Series. The Dodgers right now are healthy. The yeah. Mets are healthy. Even with, even with Harvey, they're healthy. I mean, this is why they're winning. Cardinals are Cardinals are well, you know, they've had some problems, but they they're deep and they have this winning culture. Like they're like the Giants. The Giants, even though they're out of it, they're still, you know, they're battling right to the end. I love that attitude yeah. of that team. Do you Great actually team. think we're gonna have a repeat of the eighty five uh, Cardinals uh, I don't know in Kansas City? I would be something with it across uh, state World Series. And that was a great World Series. Was, yeah. And unfortunately, Don Denkinger ruined it for the, for the Cardinals. <laughs> Which Marquee. I was actually happy about because I, yeah. I was rooting for I was rooting for Kansas City, too. And I'm, I'm going to root for them again. I mean, I'd love to see them back. They, they came so close to beating the Giants last year. And yeah. I kind of felt badly for them because they've been waiting longer than the Giants have. Sure. I mean, I was, a, I was not very happy when they beat the A's in the wild card. That was an amazing was, game. Great Amazing, game, but dude. very frustrating. Yeah, very frustrating. After that, I mean, I was not a Kansas City hater. Yeah. No, how can you be? Okay, so here we go. We're going to go to uh, first commercial break. Of course, we got IFB now. Oh, that's right. The Giants. That's right. I like him. Yeah. He was hurt, too. Yeah. Okay, uh, first uh, trivia question here has to do with 1980 baseball. Which player hit the most home runs in the 1980s? Mm. The first email with the correct answer is going to win that free three day, two night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email Edward at sports. Econ101.com, the answer to this question. Which player hit the most home runs in the 1980s? Mm. And yes, you've heard of this player, of course, yeah. or else he would have hit that many home I runs. I probably covered him, too. I'm sure I, I did, because there's very few players in the 1980s I did not cover. That's true. Now, you know, you have to figure out, was he 
playing in the 70s too, in the 90s too, but in the 1980s he hit the yeah. most home runs. Okay. All right, stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown along with Bruce McGowan. We will be right back. Yeah, baby. That's, that's what, what I'm talking about. We're going to go. We're going to right back because we're going to yeah, go. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, uh, having too much fun. Yeah, how's that Claudia? She's doing fine, you know, it's no no problems. I mean, she's been a little, kind of a little uptight with me lately because, you know, the house finally is on the market. Today was huh? the first day. Okay. And there oh, were yeah, lots of little open. things for me to do, and, you know, I was doing some of them, and some of them like, we couldn't get done, and we had to wait on them, and she was like, you know, my back went out, and I, she oh, wanted me to me. throw away a lot of the stuff in the man cave, and I, I organized some of it, but I couldn't throw all of it away. So I told man. the our sales gal, I said, look, you, you need to have everybody look at the, the storage area. It's in pretty good shape. Oh, okay. uh, you know, when we get closer, yeah. So I've been sort of incrementally taking stuff out of there. I should bring some of that over to you because there's a lot of good old sports stuff. You'd probably like old oh, programs. Love, love to, you love like old football programs from the 1980s and 90s? That'd be fun to look at. 49 or 40 football programs? Yeah, yeah, sure. Because you know? I got no use for them. You might, you might you'd probably throw them away too eventually, but they're fun to look at. Yeah, no, 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 look at they got, and they, you know, in the old days, they actually had articles up until the 19, late 90s. They, in, the, in the programs, they had articles. They were well written down. It's huh. just all pictures, statistics and pictures. People don't have any patience anymore to read. It's really sad. Wow. It's through. Isn't that why they, uh, home teams, a lot of them don't have the names on the back so that people buy the programs? Figure out yeah, probably, yeah, in the old days, yeah. Giants, the Giants are one of the few teams not to, to have names on the back anyway. I don't like that. I like the names on the back. See, I kind of like it old-fashioned. <laughs> Plus, they have the no no stripes on the greenery. It's all just flat grass without the greenery. You know, the stripes. I hate those. Oh, the stripes. Yeah, they yeah. get a little annoying. Uh, yeah. Get this bit striped in. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown here along with Bruce McGowan. We cut to the first commercial break. We asked this 1980. Baseball trivia question. Which player hit the most home runs in the 1980s? I'm going to say Dave Winfield. You know, that would have been a good guess. It's not yeah. right, but it would have been a good, good guess. Eddie Murray? No? No? I'll keep going. Just keep going. Uh, America, 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 about 5, America. people have to go. Yeah, America, America or National League? Uh, National. Okay. Played for the same team. Played with the same team? Yep. All for of his life. All of his for life. All of his life. For his entire career. For his entire career. And he started in the 70s and quit in the 90s, probably. I believe that's correct. Okay. Good player. Oh, good player. Hit lots of home runs. God, I'm, I'm I mean, as soon as I mention you, oh, yes, of course. Go ahead. Mike Schmidt. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mid-70s is when he started his career. Mid-80s is when he quit. He, he played for almost 20 years. With yeah, one team. In the 90s, yeah. Nice yeah. guy, too. Very good guy. He seems, like, he seems like a Very good guy. guy, yeah. Okay. Good guy. Uh, just switching just a little bit of NBA. We don't have... Uh, uh, Bob Myers with us. Uh, he'll join us sometime in the future. General manager for the the uh, winning NBA championship Warriors, our hometown team, team here. So I don't know. Have you read anything about the new NBA playoff structure? You know, I've heard little about it, and I, there's been a lot of talk about how they should change it, and they should. But I, I, to be honest with you, no, I haven't heard. Of, have they finalized any kind of a, a thing? Or are they talking about? It looks. It looks like. It looks like it's. Uh, so it's going to be just. Is it's basically you're going to be. Uh, probably seated by your record, not by Correct. where you are. That's good. Yeah. You shouldn't get a, you know, if like if you get a second with a record of 10 below 500, you shouldn't get one of the better playoff berths. That's wrong. Yeah. So I was going to ask yeah. uh, Bob that question. Remind yeah. me when he comes on. I'm sure he'll question. agree. Uh, the other question I was going to ask him, I'm going to throw this out to you here, is uh, how, how, when you have a winning team like, okay, this is the Warriors, right? How do they decide about breaking it up rather than just it as is. Even if you have players, you go, uh, You know, if you don't want to break it up unless there's, sometimes you get older players and they're they're coming up on their free agency and you, you realize that they're not going to re-sign for a year or two and you have to just say goodbye. And that's tough to do. The Warriors right now are in a good position. They have, the core of their players are young and they're going to be around for a while. But there are not that many teams that are in that position. So if you're not in that position and you do have a great team and you do, and you know you're going to lose a player, or two to free agency. You just have to be very judicious about who you lose and hopefully replace that guy with a cheaper version of him, a younger version of him. And the good teams do that. Uh, San Antonio does that. They never uh, have to rebuild. They reload. The great teams do that. Yeah, that, That's what the 49ers used to do. I mean, think about the 49ers. Bill Walsh always used to say, look, I'll go, I will cut a guy a year ahead of time 
because I know if I don't, then I won't get maximum value for him, or he won't yeah, get maximum right. value for his career. And, you know, it's kind of a two-way street. Bill, yeah. Bill Walsh was looking for the team first, but he also realized it was better for the player if he cut him loose because he still had high value. He could get a good job elsewhere. Whereas if he stayed with the 49ers, he might not get as much money. And so it worked out usually for the best for everybody. Interesting. Yeah. And Walsh was, a, you know, team first, obviously, and he was an organization man, but he did care about his players to the point where he wanted to see them maximize their opportunities because he knew most of these guys were not going to, you know, they weren't premium surgeon uh, quality type people, and uh, most of them are going to live just normal blue collar lives, you know, after making white collar money. And that's, that's a tough adjustment. That's a tough, I think we ought to do a show about that sometimes about, and we should talk to a couple of athletes who have been through the wars. Dwight Clark would be a great guest, by the way, because he, he was very wealthy and he lost everything. I mean, he literally lost everything. Now, was it due to divorce? And well, it was a combination of things. He had divorce killed him and some friend, you know, absconded with a bunch of money that he said he was going to invest. He made some bad investments. It just, it was like a perfect storm. And I remember talking to Dwight about a year and a half ago, and I wanted to get him on the show, and he just was too raw. He said, look, I, I'm going through two times. And he's, just, he's really bounced back nicely. And Dwight, uh, Dwight Clark, for those of our listeners who don't know, was, was a very fine receiver from the late 70s to the late 80s with the Niners. He was a part of their first Super Bowl winning teams. He, he actually made the, the iconic catch yeah, that beat Dallas for the NFC title and vanquished them and on the way to their first Super Bowl title. Really good guy. Retired at the age of 34, 35. Married a beautiful woman. Seemingly had the world on a string, and then just you know a bad series of breaks. Uh, the marriage didn't work out. Investments didn't work out. A partner turned out to be a criminal. I mean, you talk about bad luck. And then and you he, wonder how, how did the how, too many times you hear how these guys go broke, but you wonder did the wives go broke too? Sometimes you know I hate to say it because I when I was younger I used to hang around a little bit more with the athletes, and you would not believe. I mean, some of the women they hang out with they're okay, but. Some of these gals, they're just, they're almost predatory. Yeah. You know, they're looking for a guy they know they can hook, and there's a certain type of woman that will do that. I'm not saying most of the guys will gravitate towards that, because eventually, you know, that gets pretty scary. But, I mean, there's a lot of it in sports. Uh, there are a lot of people who are taking, and not just women. They're guys that are investors that are trying to take advantage of yeah. guys that don't know their P's and Q's, you know. And uh, I hate to see that, too. I hate to see some of these agents, what they're doing. I wasn't thinking so much uh, predatory. I was thinking more just the, the general, they get divorced. Yeah. They're going to so have what, half half what the guy gets. Yeah. yeah. Or it's more if they got kids. Woman. Yeah, exactly. So then yeah. she ends up, you know, again, typical because we're talking about male athletes. Yeah. You know, she ends up doing very well financially. Yeah, that's and right. And he ends up going bankrupt. Well, yeah. I mean, it's not an ideal situation. Nobody wants to be in that situation. I don't know if there are that many women that really would like to. Put somebody in that situation, number one, or themselves, because it isn't. It's even if you do. Well, it's not even purposeful. Yeah. You know, I mean, if she but makes just, good decisions after the divorce, yeah. she makes poor decisions. It's a little. You've seen it happen though in pro sports. You've seen yeah. you know guys go broke and guys go really fall off the deep end, and uh, the women that they're with, they end up taking everything because they got the kids, and you know, I mean, I wonder, boy. If, I wonder if you could have like sort of in the contracts that mandatory financial counseling. I think that's something, you know, more and more players do have somebody like that with their agent, and usually their agent will hook them up with somebody. But it surprises me that more teams don't have, like, okay, you're joining our club, we're paying you a lot of money just for your own good. You don't have to take our advice, but we have somebody available that can help you with investments or help you with financial advice. I don't know. I think some teams do that, but I, I don't think enough do. And especially in football, because football players are not paid as well as. Uh, hockey, basketball, or baseball players. The reason being that there are more jobs and their uh, labor is cheaper. And uh, quite honestly, you know, they don't last as long, and they're so they have a shorter shelf life. So they're, you know, the bit the guys like the Brady's, you know, and, and the uh, Aaron and, and the Mannings, they're making the big money. But you know, your average guys making good money, you know, four hundred thousand, six hundred thousand. But it may only be for a couple of years yeah. if they're lucky. And then uh, there's no guaranteed contracts in the NFL unless you have a special deal. So, you know, NFL players get the worst of it. From all it's angles. too easy to get yeah. hurt there. I mean, yeah. you didn't get hit and hurt in baseball, but uh, well, yeah, it's the glamour sport. Well, you know, if I had a kid that was athletically talented enough to play any pro any sports, I'd say play basketball or baseball, yeah, or even yeah. hockey, but not football. Football is just it's destructive to the human body, and your ch chances are you're not going to make a lot of money doing it if you're lucky enough to get that far. But again, I, I love this sport. I will watch it religiously. I'm going to every single Raider 49er game this fall for the first time in years because I'm I'm doing a lot of work covering them. So. Um, but I just, I feel for the guys that play the sport sometimes, uh, Edward, I think sometimes they just, uh, they know what they're doing, 
they're growing up, they're making their own decisions, but sometimes I, I just wonder, God, if, at the end of the day, are they looking back and saying, boy, <laughs> I should have done that. Was it worth it? Yeah. Was it worth it? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. We had Jim Otto. On oh yeah, remember what he said? Yeah, and he, he, he actually said, even though he lost his leg, he you know, yeah, from all the you know being a center for so Oh, he's long. in a wheelchair. He's in a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and lost a leg. Yeah. And in his case, he said he wouldn't change a thing. No. Well, well he, a lot of these guys don't. If you think about it, no. you have a short career, but you get you know these these head injuries and the concussions and all that. Now you got a bunch of medical bills uh -huh. afterward. Yeah, and most of the time, the teams are not going to watch out for you financially after you're out of the game. And the and you know what really makes me upset more than the, more than the owners are the play is the players' union today. They don't take care of their own. They take care of the guys that are playing. But the former players, they just don't give it you know a hoot about these they, guys. They don't have any uh, retirement type of. They, uh, well, they only started that you know in the 1990s. I mean, anybody who played before the 1990s is screwed unless they invested well and how many guys did it's just it's very sad and i talked to a guy who played in the 1970s he made decent money but he's he's struggling he says ah oh, you know i had some health, health problem i went to the union and they said they weren't going to do anything about it they couldn't do anything about it and, you know just because they didn't want to and the thing is back then you know they made quote good money for back then yeah so nothing oh, compared to no them. i mean the guys were making 50 60 70. Yeah. george atkinson told me he was a decent player for the raiders defensive yeah. back played in the 70s and he made an average of about sixty thousand a year, which was good money in those days. But compared to today, yeah. come on. Well, unless you invested very wisely. Yeah, but you know, it was funny. Sixty thousand sounds like a lot of money in nineteen seventy. Oh, I remember my, yeah. I remember my dad yeah. was making. I remember when my dad told me he came home and he goes, "I got a, I got a nice bump in my salary." This is nineteen seventy one. I said, "What'd you get?" He goes, "I'm four, I got forty five thousand." Whoa, that 40, is, yeah, that, that, that was a lot of a money in those days. For a non-athlete type yeah. Person, yeah, yeah, I remember I remember when he got 50, he was so proud of himself. He wasn't that much into the, the money thing, but it was the idea that he was being respected enough to be paid that much. And now it's fifty thousand dollars. That's the starting salary of a of a young kid getting into yes. the uh, tech business. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah know, that, that, that's about what it is. That, that's that's yeah. exactly it. Yeah, I remember yeah. working for a, a company in uh, nineteen seventy eight and uh, I was doing a lot of the room bookkeeping type stuff for them. And, and so I, I remember seeing the uh, the CEO made twenty five dollars an hour. Wow! And, and that's you know that's fifty thousand a year. Fifty thousand. Well, that's and, a good amount of money in those yeah, days. And the second in command made yeah. twenty dollars an hour. Yeah, well, Which you know, it was good money back then. Well, and it, it, it's true. The structure of everything has changed dramatically, as you know. Uh, you know, the people that are making a lot of money now. There's not as many. But they're making so much more than everybody else, and this is true in, in sports. It's, yeah. it's part of the well, it's uh, part of the CEO thing. It's like yeah. making five hundred times the oh, yeah. salary. Definitely. Okay, here we go. Um, back to our trivia. Time for another break here. Sounds 1980s good. 1980s baseball. I missed the first missed one. Missed the first one. Bummed about that. But you were close. Dave Winfield. Yeah. That's pretty close to Mike Schmidt. Yeah, they played New York, Philadelphia. There, there you go. go. Yeah. Exactly. Different okay. leagues, but close. East yeah. Coast. Yeah, yeah, East Coast. Who was the only pitcher to lose twenty games in the nineteen? Oh, in one season. In one season, yeah. Wow. Uh, the first email with the correct answer wins a free three day, two nights stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportsecon101.com. The answer to this question Who was the only pitcher to lose 20 games in the 1980s? Was he a pretty good pitcher, Jeff? Uh, you know what? I don't remember this guy. So maybe he was a good pitcher. Hey, uh, stay with us, Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back. Uh, I got I, I, I'm totally flummoxed. This, this for that. one's tough only because for me, only because. Because you don't know who he is? I. Can't you'll probably. Who was it? I'm not going to answer, but who was it? I'm just curious. I don't know tell you anywhere. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> see, I almost got you there. <laughs> yeah, I almost yeah, got yeah, you. Almost, I was ready to tell you. No, no, I was going to sneak in that I do. Just <laughs> hey, what are you doing, man? Of course, you could make you look really smart. You go, oh, I know that. Of course, it's yeah. so and so. <laughs> exactly. That's funny. Where do you come up with these questions anyway? You just I, I go online and look just, for like various sports trivia. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Now, the thing is, like, a lot of the stuff, I mean, I just don't. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Know. Most of it's pretty, pretty right on. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. Uh, a, I also need to purposely check it. And I gotta go to a. This is so silly. My wife wants me to go at seven o'clock to eight thirty tonight to a volleyball symposium where they're going to discuss the rules. I said, Clint, I know the rules to volleyball. Why do I have? Because well, your volleyball. daughter is playing that's it. it. I said, I'm not even coaching. What? Why do I have to go to a place where where they're going to discuss the rules that I already know? And I'm not even coaching. She goes, Just go. <laughs> where is it? It, it's in Larkspur. Yeah, for it's for youth, for youth, youth soccer yeah. parents. Yeah, it's like come on, I already know. What do you need to know? I know about the it's three hits. I know about. Is she going to? No, I gotta go. And you're bringing Molly. 
No, Molly doesn't know. For some reason, she wants me. She didn't even explain to me. She wants me to be acquainted with the rules because I'll be going to the games. What? Even if I didn't know the rules, it's important for me to know the rules sitting there. Well, I mean, I, I got to understand. Why? I, I, I would understand if, if I was if coaching. You, if you're coaching, yeah. refereeing, or, or if you're bringing Molly to it so that you guys can discuss it. But I understand. Go by yourself. I know the rules already. <laughs> I played volleyball, why, and I told her this. I said, "Why don't I?" said, "I already That's know the rules." That's funny. I don't know. It's funny. It is funny. Yeah, I funny. said, "I already know the rules." I know all the rules. I played. I played competitive volleyball. Bruce, you're being involved, Dad, and that's just the end. That's of it. exactly <laughs> right. She just was. You know, she wants to flex her muscles once in a while with me, because she knew I was going to go surfing today. She knew I was going to have a day off, or I was going to enjoy myself. So it's like, okay, this is your yeah. penance. But could your penance be to be around her? Well, you know, she's hanging out with her folks this week. We're staying with her folks while the house is being oh, yeah. So she's having a good time. So, you know. Plus, I, I didn't get what she wanted. She wanted me to get a haircut and a beard trim today, and the guy wasn't there. Uh, so that's another thing that's going to be a strike against me. So it'd be best if I'm not around the house tonight. Well, I can tell. Could, after this show, couldn't you go get the haircut trimmed? Do you have to go to the same guy? Uh, yeah, I like to go to the same guy. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of picky. Oh, you know, it's not that big a deal. I could probably go to, you know, one of these cheap places to... I like to support the local guy, you know. I'm not funny well, that way. Do you have a certain guy you yeah. like? Problem is, he's an older guy. He's probably about seventy, yeah. and he only shows up three days a week. So I have to keep. I keep forgetting which days he's there. He's there Friday, Saturday, and or no, Friday, Saturday, and Monday. It's oh, weird. Monday, yeah. yeah. Monday's a nice day. Yeah. Never open on Monday. It's weird. So that looks like a Sports Illustrated there. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it has a quick thing on Kyrie yeah. Irving. Oh, cool. It's, it's an old one now. It's goes back to February, but well, Sports. Yeah, you, know, you can take an old one from. 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and, and it just, it's great writing. Yeah, the, and, and great it's, just, it's just a little, it's just a little blur. I hate throwing all my Sports Illustrated out. I just feel, I feel like I'm throwing it's out so all this. Long. Who's going to buy a 1972 Sports Illustrated? You know, I mean, really, yeah, I guess, who, I guess who's going to buy them? Yeah. Nobody. I, I mean, there, there might be, you're right, there might be some collector out there, but to find them? What do you do? Yeah, you know, like a pawn shop. You know, you know what I could do is I could probably go to my Facebook page and say, hey, I've got a bunch of Sports Illustrated that I'm wanting to sell for 25 a copy. That's good. And 25 cents a copy. Unless it's like, you know, the, if it's somebody famous, you know, like Pete Rose is on the cover, I'll, you know, <laughs> okay, different but story. You yeah. keep some of that. Oh, I do. I have a fair number of cover art. Okay. There we go. Well, welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, along with Bruce McGowan. When we got to the second commercial break, we asked this trivia question. This one I thought was kind of hard, actually. Who was the only pitcher to lose 20 games in the 1980s? Well, it had to be somebody who pitched for a very bad team. The thing about the 80s was that was an era of parity. There were so many teams that that oh, had sure. bad years and good years. You know, there was no one dominant team, and there was no one really dog meat team. So, okay, so I'll, I'll give you because I think this one's a hard one. Yeah. I'll give you a hint. Okay. It was in 1980. In 1980, which yeah, league? That's the first American. American. Eastern team or Western team? Western. Western team. Now we're getting close. So, yep. West Coast team? Yep. So, you like the Dodgers and the Padres? Eric Sheck? No, it's Sheck. American League. Oh, American League. Okay. So, it'd be somebody on the Angels A's. or the A's? A's. Uh, Matt, Matt Keough? No. no? Uh, okay. I'm trying close, close to it. I remember, I can't remember the guy's name, but I do remember an A guy. An A's pitcher loses 20. Who was it? Brian Kingman. Oh, yeah, Brian, yeah, Brian Kingman was actually a good pitcher. Yeah. He was actually a good pitcher for a couple of years. He was a part of Kingman. But I don't well, in, 19, in 1981, the A's came out of nowhere, won the division. It was you know Rick Langford and Brian Kingman. and Oh, I can't remember who else was on that staff. They had a really Steve McCaddy. They all were really good the year before. And then in 1981, they peaked. And in 82, they just all, Billy Martin had each one of those guys throwing 15, 20 complete games each, and their arms just died next year. Oh. Just yeah, that's, died. Really, that's the thing is you got to really think that stuff ahead. Well, it's interesting too that not only did their arms die, but that was the era where the relief specialists started to take over. The first time you really saw the save becoming an important part of the game. Bert Belilevin always talks about the nineteen early nineteen eighties as being that time. Guys like Lee Smith, you know, one of, oh, yeah. one of the first great relief pitchers, or Steve Bedrosian, you know, who later oh, became yeah. a relief pitcher with the Giants, actually for. He was, he was really with best with Philly. That's an interesting time. You know, a fun thing I have to say about, I covered a lot of baseball in the 1980s. Players were a lot more, um, <laughs> how do I say this, kind of, kind of uh, down to earth when they spoke with you. I mean, they, they freely used uh, profanity almost as a part of the language. And then they, when they were, if they were doing an interview with you and then it, it popped out, they'd sort of 
I have a funny look in their face. Like, oh, geez, I can't believe you say that. But the, but the writers were all excited because what would happen, or the broadcasters, they would take that tape, and of course they cut out the profanity, but then they would bootleg it to all their buddies, and they'd have the you know, guy saying all these funny things, especially when they get angry, you know. You blink any blank blanks, you know. I never forget Lee Elia, uh, and I wasn't there when this happened, but the Cubs had lost 14 of their first 19 games, and they just got destroyed on a weekday afternoon by somebody like uh, Pittsburgh. And Lee Elia was, you know, just absolutely furious at his players, at the world, at the fans. There weren't that many fans there. And he goes, oh, I'm just so glad we scuffed it up for them, blinking 4,000 that showed up. The rest of these people out here, what are they doing out here? They have, they have, a, have a job. Most of them are don't even work. They're, that's why they're at the bleeping game. <laughs> they have a job in New Orleans Lake to have a, earn a bleeping living. You know, it just went on and on and on. It was like, oh my God. You know, it was so funny. And the funny thing, the funny thing about Lee is I got to know him later. He was one of the most mild-mannered, friendly guys, but he just, the Italian temper got the worst of it that one time, and he is forever immortalized. If you go to some website, I'm sure you'll find it uncensored, the Lee Elia diatribe after a Cubs game in 1983. <laughs> and it's classic. And I love that a lot of these guys did that. Tommy Lasorda used to do that. He'd spit his pasta out at you. <laughs> you know, like, Tommy, take it easy. I'm just asking an innocent baseball question. These guys were so sensitive. Though, first, first, well, if I lost 14 of the first 19 games. And the thing is, you've got to realize his job's on the line. Yeah. You know, or something like that. It's funny you mentioned Steve Petrosian because. Nice guy. That, that's one of, is he? He's a great that, guy. That's one of those names that. And fortunately, you know, he, by the time he got to the Giants, and he had like one or two decent yeah, one or I don't two years. years he played with us, but then a couple years. after a while, it was well, just he was so older. scary. Yeah. You know, he, every time he'd go in, you'd, you'd cringe know. knowing that you were going to probably lose. And, and that taints the career. I mean, you really have to yeah. forget about that. Just remember him with the fans. Well, it's, it happens with a lot of guys. They don't, they, they want to keep playing. It's not that they. They're so egotistical that they want to build up their stats, although everybody wants to do that to a degree. But it's, they just, I mean, what, they know that where are they going to get that kind of feeling anywhere else in life but other than the baseball field. So they try, you talk to every player and they say the toughest part is retiring, even when you know you should, because you have to give up that feeling being around the guys, being around the ball. Yeah. I mean, I have to tell you, I, I've only been covering baseball for many, many years and I haven't covered as much as I used to. And I have to say, to a certain degree, I do miss being around that. Sure. Uh, uh, atmosphere every day. I was going to 150 games a year on a regular basis and, you know, get to the ballpark three hours ahead of time, stay till two or three hours afterwards. It was a way of life, and I think when you give that up as a player, especially, it's tough. I mean, the family's going to fill some of the void and maybe a career and something else will, but you're going to be doing something in life that's not going to be nearly as much fun once you're out of baseball. I wonder if they, uh, you know, when they're in their last year, the last contract or whatever, if they're already starting to put the feelers out, even with, let's say, the current club and say, listen, is there I've got to be retiring here pretty soon. You know, soon. some guys do. I mean, some guys, like J.T. Snow is smart. He, he got a little uh, community relations work, a little announcing work, and then he branched out in his own business uh, situation. Tim Hudson, I think, is a guy who's going to retire after this year, and I think he'll be just fine. He's a, got a good head on his shoulders, a great wife, great family, um, and it's nice to see him playing well down the stretch. He, he won a game the other night, had a home run, pitched six strong innings. He's 40 years old. He's like, well, you know, I'm not going to get any better than this. This is, you know, even though we're not going to go to the playoffs I'm having a great time I woke up a ring last year think about what he went through he didn't get to win a championship until he was 39 and then right at the end of his career what a, what a way to do it yeah. that's got to be the sweetest you know wait till you're 39 and then do it right at the end well, you, you, uh, as compared to Nolan Ryan who got it when he was a rookie with yeah the Mets. that's right and he never everyone always forgets when he was with the Mets and then he never got it again I don't yeah. believe I mean no. he, he was on some good teams but he, what, he pitched six no hitters I was at one of those no hitters he was, you know, he pitched this, the fourth one I saw was against the A's in 1990, 91, I believe it was. And he was about 38, 39 at the time. And I was thinking, God, this guy's pitching a no hitter at 38 or 39. Yeah. And that was a different uh, team than getting his fifth 5,000 strikeout. Yeah. That's Ricky Henderson. Yeah, that's another one where he had, you know, he had so many milestones. He was, but he had a buy on a car. Guys like that, you know, they, they just, they're not. Juan Marichal was that way. He never got hurt. You know, never got hurt. That's, I've always felt badly for Sandy Koufax because. I think he would have had a, a career they're still talking about today. They still do talk about it, but everybody would be talking about it. But he only had four great years, and then he was 30, and his career was done because he had this horrible elbow problem. Horrible oh, elbow problem. He had retired. Tom John surgery. Well, they didn't even have that then. He had retired at the age of 30. But he'd had four 21 seasons. He'd won three World Series championships. He'd won two Cy Youngs. I mean, he climbed the mountain. There wasn't much more for him to climb. And, you know, he's done fine. Kind of reminds me of, like, Gale Sayers. 
Yeah, yeah. Not that long, really. But no, because it's neat. You know who wrecked his career? Was Jim, remember Jimmy Johnson, the 49ers? Yeah. Yeah. Hit, hit him, and then Herman Alexander, the 49ers, hit him later when he came back. Both those guys just destroyed his name. They didn't mean to, but they did. Yeah. Yeah, he was only 27 when he had to retire. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's what he wrecked. Yeah. yeah, just going back, I had this article here. That this is going all the way back to February um, with uh, Sports Illustrated, but uh, a total change of subject here. But uh, I've been wanting to bring this up, but we sure. have so many good guests, I never had a chance to. So Kyrie Irving, all right, very, very, very good player, right? So, excuse me, um, Kyrie Irving could have made uh, seven to ten million dollars based on incentive clauses in his contract if he had been elected an All Star Game starter. Interesting. And he finished fourth among guards in fan voting. Mm -hmm. Now the thing that's that's so tough about that is, um, you know, it, it was based on. Um, the fans voting. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what other criterion can you use? I mean, that's an all star, is the fans voting. And maybe it's not fair, but that's you accept it when you sign that as part of your contract. So, yeah, but then what, what do you have to do? You have to kind of suddenly be, you know, a, 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 a certain personality, boisterous type person. You I know what know. I mean? I mean, I, I mean yeah. he was good enough to, to be a starter. Sure. sure. But, you know, he signed a contract with that clause, and he knew that the fans were going to be voting, so he knew the fans were going to be fickle. So, you know, he took that chance. He was hoping maybe the fans would vote. The problem when you play in Cleveland is you, you have a great fan base there, but it's not the kind of fan base you get if you were in L.A. or New York or Chicago. And sure. it's just a fact. And it's, it's too it's bad. A, yeah. It's unfortunate because certain players get in who don't even deserve it. No. Speaking of Cleveland, I, you know, I, I feel for the fans. That's a great sports town. They have not won a World's Championship in any, in any major sport since 1964. That's 51 years. And now that wasn't even a Super Bowl, really. Well, it was the NFL championship. Jim Brown retired the next year. But, uh, you know, that's, got, that's, I mean, we've had, since 1972 here in the Bay Area, we've got 16 championship teams that have won it all. We've had 30 that have been in a position to win it all. 30! How many has Cleveland had? Maybe two or three that have been in a position to win it all? Yeah, that's Cameron. right. The uh, Indians, Indians lost to the Braves. They lost to the Braves, Braves, lost to the Marlins. Uh, the Browns never have been to a Super Bowl. And, of course, the... Cavaliers have been to the finals, but they've lost both times. Yeah. So, yeah. In fact, didn't LeBron said this one really hurt? Yeah, he said. I thought that he said the last one hurt the most, but I think you know he has nobody to blame about that one, including certainly he played his heart out, uh, his heart yeah. out. But look at look at all the injuries. Yeah. And yeah, they got killed. If they had every, if they had Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love, that might have been a different series. Yeah. The Warriors might not have beaten them. I think the Warriors got a real break. That, they had no injuries. They won a lot of close games. They won a lot of games against teams that were just at the wrong, you know, they hit the, and the playoff matchups. They played the right, the only tough yeah. team they played was Memphis. And Cleveland was tough for the first few games, but then they faded quickly. But yeah. Memphis was the only team that really gave them a tough time. Yeah, because the Pelicans didn't really. Oh, yeah, they did yeah. it for a while for a game or two. But the, yeah. the, the third game, the Pelicans had them down by 20 going into the fourth quarter, and they lost. That just destroyed. Oh, that one shot! Yes. Oh, Curry. can you imagine being on a, on the New Orleans team and then they should have shot at that fan who's just like a gape? You know yeah, what? Yeah. And it's like, um, excuse me, how can you let a guy shoot a three pointer? Yeah, that? I know. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, that's the kind right of season it was for the Warriors. Though. Every shot they were taking at a critical time went in. I mean, you could feel it's so much fun to be around a championship winning team during the season because you can tell it's going to happen. Yeah. You, you say to yourself, "Yeah, you got to have a lot of breaks, but." I, with the Warriors, I could tell it was going to happen. I wasn't sure with the Giants last year. With the Warriors, I was sure. Yeah, really when, they, when they went, what, 21 games in a row or something like that, yeah. I said that this is it. And yeah. Clay Thompson, uh, oh, 37 points in a 37 game. points in a quarter. <laughs> what, is, what, is, what is with that? Yeah. Jeez, what do, you have, what do you have for breakfast? Yeah. You know? Yeah, what do you have for lunch? Well, and it's like you said with, uh, you know, last year the Giants didn't have too many injuries. No, none. Now this year, you know, half their regulars on their – you know, everyday roster are out, and their pitching is old, and they, you know that just happens. This is un life is unfair, as Kennedy once said. Some men are sent to Vietnam, and uh, some get to go to uh, San Francisco. Life is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> was that actually the quote? Uh, you know, I heard. I remember hearing that when I was a kid, and he was talking about it was early in the Vietnam War, and we had made a big commitment, and he was talking about how you know there are tough choices I I have to make as president, you know, and if you're a soldier, sometimes you have a tough break, you know, you get. Some men get sent to Vietnam, but others get to go to San Francisco. You know, the, the idea being that San Francisco is a great town to hang out yeah. in. You know. but, well, the thing is, I mean, he was uh, in charge of DC-109. Yeah, that's right. It got sliced in half by the Japanese destroyer. That's a, that's quite a story. Did you ever see the movie with Philip Robertson? Um, I, years ago. Yeah. yeah, pretty amazing story when you think about it. He was very, he, 
he was very lucky to get those guys out of there, John Kennedy. That was, and that wrecked his back. His back was never the same after that. Yeah. Yeah. So but when, again, when, there was a guy who, I mean, because Joseph Kennedy was a somebody. Boy, he was a he was a rough character, yeah. though, operating on the fringes of the law. And then during the war, during the Second World War, he was initially before the war started. He was initially telling FDR, the president, I don't think we should support the, you know, I don't think we should give the British any help. You know, basically leave them alone and, yeah. and let the Germans do whatever they. Because he he had a lot of money invested in German um, industry, uh, and so you know he was kind of a. But he didn't get his son out of the war. No, well, you know, in those days, nobody wanted to get out of the war. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. Not yeah. like the Civil War, where you hired a substitute if you were a rich person. Oh yeah. You know, there were. Or the yeah. Vietnam War was tough. Too. Vietnam yeah. War is a different Korean war. war. Yeah, yeah. Korean War also. Yeah. One. Yeah, that was a forgotten. Uh, okay, here we go. Last uh, trivia question. Nineteen uh, eighties baseball. By the way, no one ever won a war by dying for his country. He made the other poor, you know what, die for his country. Americans love to fight. They love the sting of battle. Who was that quote? I wouldn't give a hoot for a man who laughed and lost. <laughs> That's because Americans have never lost a war and never will. Because the idea of losing is hateful to Americans. <laughs> General go. Patton. But it's actually Patton. George, George C. Scott George doing, Scott doing Patton. Okay. And then Patton didn't actually sound like that. Okay. Here, yeah. real, 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 <laughs> Sorry about that. I just got okay. the character. Real quick. Yeah. Which player had the most RBIs in the 1980s? Ooh, good one. Right? That's a good Stay one. Stay with us. Sports Econ 101 will have some closing comments. And maybe even some more quotes. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> I'll do my Winston Churchill for you. Okay. Do what I got. Let's just say it's kind of breaking something a little bit. Oh, yeah. United States of America. Uh, oh, there's my. Yeah. Hey, Zamira, how you doing? Oh, I got two and a half hours in the water. I'm a happy camper. I'm just uh, finishing up. Uh, just recording a radio show here with my friend Ed, Edward Brown. We're almost done. What's going on? How'd things go today? Wow. Wow. Great. Right. Good. Oh, good. Yeah, I tried to get him out of there this morning, and he escaped. He escaped and ran away, and I couldn't find him. So I hope he wasn't a too much of a problem. <laughs> that's our cat. Oh, that's good. I'm glad, he, I'm glad he wasn't a distraction. I was worried he might distract people. Yeah, people are going to want to buy the house with the cat. They're going to go, hey, I want that cat, too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Um, now, the, you were talking about somebody getting downstairs to look at the storage area. Was that the pest control guy or the inspection? Ah. Oh. Okay. And you know where the keys are to the downstairs, right? They're on top of the they're on top of the armor. There's just one. There are actually two keys attached to kind of a little orange plastic thing, and just just put it. That's the, that's the only key to the downstairs. But if you if you look on top of the armor, there it is, and you can just take it out and use it. And uh, real quickly, we we hired uh, a guy next week to come in and check on the rat thing, and I think Christina is bringing in a guy to do the pest control. Um, uh, on Monday, so we got two different guys coming in for two different things. Okay, and then Will's gonna Will's not gonna be able to do any work this week. I think he said next week he'll hopefully be able to after the showings get some work done. Well, he's got to put in two more windows. He's got to put in the sliding glass the window downstairs and the and the window upstairs. Yeah, but that that won't take a lot of time. Yeah. No, they're not going to be here for another couple of weeks, probably. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds like a good day. Great. Glad to hear it, Samara. Well, you have a great, great uh, evening, and uh, give me a call if anything else comes up you need to talk about. All right. You take care. Bye bye. Yeah, brokers open. That's yeah. how you sell yeah. houses, not yeah. so much, uh, open houses. 20 brokers were up there today. Yeah. That's great. She probably had a little food here. Yeah, she did. She had a caterer. That's, that's so nice. That's how you get them there. Yeah.
Got, got the ha house looking really nice. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. All right. So let's finish off All with right. bad boy. Here's bad boy. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Last trivia question from the 1980s baseball. Which player had the most RBIs in the 1980s? Dave Parker? No, that would have been a good guess, too. Mm. That's not right. Sorry. So, same uh, league? Uh, well, he played, I remember, mostly for the American League, and then he switched to the National League. Which, which team in the American League? Uh, was with Baltimore, and then he went to the Dodgers. Oh, Eddie Murray. Eddie Murray. Eddie Murray, Murray yeah. yeah. It was one of the, I'll tell you a story about him. Yes. Sourpuss. Oh, so one of the most crazy. unpleasant human beings I've ever met. He just hated the media. He hated us. Hated us. And you'd come over to his club locker after a game. I don't care if he'd won or lost. He was the same. Sourpuss, I used to call him. He just would kind of, and he had this kind of glowering look at him, and he would just, people would just wither in his stance. They'd go, ooh, he looks nasty. <laughs> Stay away from Eddie. You know, and I'm sure. I'm was he nice to anybody? I'm sure he was nice to his team. He always was nice to his teammates. His teammates loved him. Matter of fact, uh, I never heard a single player complain about him. But the media, he wasn't, he wasn't rude. He just was, I don't want to deal with you. Kind of like Albert Bell. Albert Bell, oh, yeah. I remember going up to him once and asking him a question. He hit a game winning homer. And I was, I couldn't figure out why wasn't anybody talking to him. And I just kind of sat there in his locker and sort of mumbled something with his head down. I said, Albert, I asked the same question. He mumbled the same answer. I said, Albert, I can't hear what you're saying. He looks up at me with this, just this absolute disdain in his face. What part of no don't you understand? Well, I didn't hear no, Albert. <laughs> so tell me no to my I face. Know, you know what I did? I laughed. I, I tried to make a joke. I said, I wasn't sure if it was the end or the O. And he kind of smiled and said, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got to cut out yeah. the tape on that note. Yes. Okay, so here's the thoughts for the day. Dean Martin said, if you don't drink, don't, no, excuse me, if you drink, don't drive. Don't even cut. <laughs> That's true. He, should, he would know. He would know. He used to show up on his. Remember, he used to slide down that farmer's. Oh, yeah, that's right. That, that fireman's yeah. pole. And I think he was half in the bag he when he did that. Always half in the bag. Yeah. And then uh, the lovable drunk. Yes, exactly. And then Brent Gibber, who we just recently lost, said, "Football or pro football is like nuclear warfare. There are no winners, only survivors." That's true. That's he should know. Have. He got knocked out of a game and put in the hospital for two that's days. Chuck Bednarik. That's okay, right. Tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective. Give it away more free vacations. I like the free vacations. That's yeah. Right. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye, America. So long. All right. That's good it. show. All right. That's that's fun. Fun. Hey, you and I always have a good time when we do this. Yeah, you just got to shoot the breeze. Yeah, just shoot the breeze. breeze like two guys at the bar. That's it. <laughs>